Uh, I appreciate uh, seeing uh, some uh, of the ladies in the uh, audience today because uh, our guest speaker is Marianne Leary, and uh, I hope you have as much admiration for what she's going to share with you that uh, uh, she accomplished in, in 2009. You know, uh, I don't know if this ever happened in your family, uh, Marianne, but uh, as a youngster, uh, uh, you know, you must have uh, said, hey, Daddy, what did you do in the war? And uh, she's going to share uh, what he did in the war. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, when the war ended, I was seven years old. And uh, uh, like most of us, uh, uh, you know, we had uh, kind of short uh, uh, memories. But uh, World War II Jim, uh, German prisoner war camps were uh, called Stalags. Hitler was uh, uh, pretty prolific with uh, Stalags and uh, concentration camps. Uh, most of us learned about Stalags uh, from the movie The Great Escape, Stalag 17, and of course the long-running uh, TV series Hogan's Heroes. But the best-known camps were uh, Stalag Luft III near Sagan, Germany, now uh, Zagan, Poland. The largest camp was Stalag 7A, at Moosberg, Germany. If you want to believe this, this camp was built to house 14,000 POWs, and uh, when Patton's 7th Army liber liberated, it had 130,000 POWs in there. So uh, you can figure that out. Stalag uh, 3 was uh, famous for the March 24th uh, escape of 76 prisoners through a 360 foot tunnel. 73 were recaptured. Hitler ordered 50 of those that were captured to be executed to warn others to desist. Uh, Stalag III uh, <coughs> officer airmen arrived at the camp through accidents of war. They varied in age, military rank, education, family backgrounds. But think of this, uh, all of them had the follow following common experiences. All volunteered to go to war as airmen. All completed months uh, and years of flight training. All entered combat flying missions. All were survivors of traumatic ca catastrophes in the air. Many arrived seriously wounded. Uh, and Marion's going to cover this in much more detail, but in late January 1945, uh, Hitler's military were being squeezed. The Allied troops were uh, advancing uh, on Berlin from the north and south. The Russians were coming in from the east. In fact, they were 12 miles from Stalag Luft III. On January 26, 1945, Hitler ordered the evacuation of the camp. Uh, the senior ranking officer was a uh, colonel, Charles Goodrich, and he announced, the goons have just given us 30 minutes to be at the front gate. Get your stuff together and line up. There were 11,000 POWs in that camp, and they were forced to march uh, to a rail uh, roadhead in uh, Spenberg, Poland. Conditions were brutal. Uh, there was uh, snow, wind driving temps uh, that, that took the temps down to zero. On the road, the, P the POW column stretched for eight miles end to end. The march took uh, uh, four days, and in Spenberg, the POs were jammed into boxcars. Uh, the uh, south compound of uh, Stalag 3 plus 200 men were sent to Mooseburg, and the remaining POWs uh, were sent to uh, uh, Stalag 8D at Nuremberg, Germany. That particular uh, camp on April 13, 1945, uh, with the approaching army, were then forced to, to go to Stalag 7A, the one with 130,000. Today's speaker's uh, father was a P-51 pilot. I think he, uh, he's 21 years of age with that smile. Uh, Lieutenant Conway Leary, he was shot down over Hungary. Uh, he ended up at Stalag uh, Luft III. And uh, I'm proud to introduce to you Kriegy kid, Mary Ann Leary. And in January 2009, she commemor commemorated her father's POW march. This is her story, Mary Ann. Yeah. 
Yeah. Hopefully you can see this. We'll dim the lights. But uh, thank you for the kind invitation to speak today. Um, I, I can't tell you how wonderful it is um, to see your museum. I've been here many times for your open hangar, and uh, my father was here as well. Uh, won't be able to see it now, but I'll set it up. A picture of him uh, standing uh, outside of gunfire, and we had lots of fun memories here. Um, seeing the planes and uh, talking to other veterans of various different wars and uh, enjoying all your facilities. And my husband and I, uh, Richard, who also went on the march with me, was uh, we were both able a couple years ago to go up in gunfighter, and what a thrill. So um, again, I just congratulate you on your organization and keeping these planes uh, flying. Um, one of the planes, and, and Ronald brought this to my attention, and I had seen it out here, but your uh, Fairchild PT-19, of course, my dad trained in that. He was at Parks Air College in uh, East St. Louis, and uh, in his book, and he told me a few times, too, he, he did write a book just for the family, and I've got a copy of it uh, here for you guys to look through, but uh, he had fond memories of that plane because when he was practicing some roles in it, he had a pen and pencil set in his pocket that had been given to him by his uncle. And uh, that went flying out when he did the roll. So uh, somewhere in East St. Louis, he thinks over the horse racing track there is his uh, pen and pencil set. <laughs> but um, again, um, my dad, how this all began, he always had a love of planes, as I'm sure many of you did. Uh, he had two uncles that were pursuit pilots in World War I. And as a young man, he had, uh, he built the little planes out of balsa wood. He had them uh, hanging down above his bed in his bedroom. And he was lucky enough, uh, my grandfather took him down to the old airport when Lindbergh came <coughs> after his transatlantic uh, ocean crossing and was doing his big kind of victory tour around the United States. And so my dad was able to see him, and that was another, you know, big <coughs> highlight of, of his young, uh, young life. But uh, getting on to, to what I'm really here to talk to you about this um, march, you, you may wonder uh, what would possess 14 middle-aged <laughs> men and women uh, in their 50s and 60s to take off uh, from work, their vacation time, to go to rural Poland and parts of rural Germany to march around in the dead of winter. Well, crazy, crazy folks uh, like myself and my husband, we found uh, some folks of a like mind at a reunion, at a Stalag Luft three reunion, <coughs> And we are the next gen, as they, as they call them, so the children of the, of the veterans, of the POWs. And we met there, and, and we found that there were some other people as enthused as we were. And, and we all had our dads as our personal heroes. And, you know, we didn't know that other folks were like that, too, but, but we found these kindred spirits. And after much organization and a, and a couple of years, this finally got off the ground. But um, again, to get back to how it began, let me uh, show you. That's, uh, as, as Ronald said, that's, that's my dad in his uh, gear. I, I always loved this picture, and, and he always thought, well, my mother and I both loved it, and, and he always thought it was a little Hollywood. But uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it was a great one. And this was his squadron patch. And I, I mention that um, because if you, can, if you can see it, it's the American Beagle Squadron. And this squadron was based in North Africa in the beginning of the war. And the Eagle Squadron, as you probably are familiar with, uh, in England was getting a lot of press, doing a lot of great things, um, firing uh, flying Spitfires at the time, as our guys were too. But uh, again, they got to go into London sometimes. There were all those stories, you know, about those parties, the girls, all that. Well, my dad's squadron uh, was stuck down in North Africa, and they decided 
they needed a, a patch, they needed a little recognition, and they decided they were kind of the dogs of this war. So uh, instead of the eagles, uh, they'd be the beagles. And they did have a beagle dog who was their uh, mascot. And so uh, they put the beagle dressed up uh, in some nice evening clothes there, and a top hat, and a walking cane, you know, sticking the, the swastika. And then, of course, a champagne glass uh, with a naked girl in it. <laughs> well, let me tell you, we had a reunion of my dad's squadron um, in the 90s. We held it here in Kansas City. And my dad wanted some of these patches. He wanted big poster boards made and had those blown up. And uh, so he did that. And of course, they were in our house before the reunion. And my mother said, oh, no, 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 no. We can't have this because, of course, the girl is naked there. So my mother said, we have to clean this up because there's going to be kids there. The grandkids are going to be there at the reunion. So, uh, you know, we, we can't have this. So she had a, a friend of my father who's an artist put a bathing suit on the girl. So here we are at the reunion the first day. Um, we're at the Marriott, the Overland Park Marriott, and you know, long hallways, and we're down at the end, and so these two poster boards are up there, you know, welcoming people, showing them where the entrance is to the room. And these gentlemen, their eyesight's are not very good at this at this age, but they went directly up there and said, who messed with our patch? And that was the first thing they saw. And so that was kind of the running joke um, in the whole reunion. My mother is a little bit chagrined, but uh, she said, it was me. I did it. You know, and again, she explained, oh, we got the grandchildren here. You know, we just can't do this. Um, but anyway, so uh, there, there's another story I, I won't bore you with, maybe, maybe at lunch, but about the patch and the uh, squadron in the in the 2000s but in any event um, the plane below is is one of the versions of the of the Mustang uh, my dad flew the C model so uh, this is a little bit different this one has the bubble canopy he had the old kind of uh, this probably isn't the correct term I just call it kind of a cantilevered um, canopy a um, little bit different look and I've got a model over here that, that you guys can take a look at uh, later um, this is a little bit hard to see, but I just wanted to orient you to where some of the main prison camps were, and I don't know if this will... Yeah, I think you're in trouble there. Okay, I'll try to talk loud. Let me sit that down for a moment. Um, a lot of you may have heard of Barth. Stalag Luft 1, and it's up here on the Baltic Sea. You may have, you know, again, known of people or read of people that, uh, that were in that camp. That was a large officer's camp. And here we are, Stalag Luft 3. This is uh, the location, and not very far from Berlin, roughly about 90 miles um, from Berlin. Uh, and on our march here, Spremberg, uh, the railhead uh, that Ronald talked about, and Dresden, again, the, si uh, the site of the, the fire bombing of World War II, Colditz Castle, which you may have heard again from uh, either movies or books. They put a lot of the uh, escape artists in that, um, in that castle and fortress. And then down here, Nuremberg, uh, that was, um, again, another place some of the men uh, stopped on their long journey to Stalag Luft 7A in Moosburg. And this is where a lot of these camps from all over ended up, and that's why so many men um, in, that, in that camp. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, this is Dulag Luft in Frankfurt on the Main. And this, um, my father was shot down in Hungary. He went to Budapest for the, uh, to be interrogated at the Eastern Front Interrogation Center. He ended up over in Dulag Luft to the Western Front Interrogation Center, then up to Stalag Luft III, uh, then to Spremberg, to Dresden, and then down to Moosburg. So um, he had quite a tour. And 
as he as he says, um, he was a, a guest of uh, Mr. Mr. Hitler. <laughs> Um, another map, and again, uh, you can see just a, a more direct <coughs> shot from Stalaglow 3 down to 7A in Moosburg. And again, Moosburg is outside of Germany, so very near, um, uh, near Munich, excuse me, Munich, outside of Munich. This is um, Zagon. Poland, Zagon, Germany, Zagon, Poland. Uh, the, as you know, at the end of World War II, a lot of the um, borders changed. So at the time my father was in the war and in Stalagla III, this was German territory. After the war, uh, the border was moved and it is now part of Poland. This is the rail yard where my uh, father, along with the other prisoners, were brought into. And the day we were there, you can see it's very foggy, kind of spooky, and uh, with that old water tower there. And they also had a, um, a pillbox there that uh, we went into. And you could see, um, again, get a little bit of the feel how the, the prisoners must have felt with guns trained on them um, as they were unloaded. This is a picture of the camp as it uh, looked during the war. These low buildings, those are the barracks. Uh, in the background, there's a large uh, building that stored a lot of the uh, Red Cross parcels. And in that, uh, that building still stands today and it looks very much the same. Uh, the camp, the foreground is all gone. The trees in the, in the building are, are still there. Uh, this is what remains actually in the camp. There, there are a few other areas that have some remains of some fire pools, um, some wash basins and stands. But this is the north compound, and this is where the RAF was. This was where the tunnel Harry came out of. Um, this was where Roger Bushel, um, the mastermind of the Great Escape uh, had his barracks. Uh, we got to stand in his barracks, and um, if you've seen the movie The Great Escape, uh, the character uh, was Bartlett. Uh, they changed some names, but um, again, a real, uh, real people, and a very compelling story. Uh, up in the top part of this, this is a postcard from Stalagla Three. They have a small museum there, and as you can see up in the upper corner, there is um, a replica of a barracks that's just been built in the last few years by the RAF. The RAF um, traveled to the camp almost on an annual basis, and uh, we learned that they, with their young men, take this march uh, that we did as a team builder and to get in touch with their history. So they also have some projects that they do um, at the site of the camp to try to improve it. And then again, um, since uh, unlike the movie and, and what you may have heard, there were no Americans that were part of the Great Escape. Well, let me be clear about that, that escaped. Uh, they were all RAF, uh, other members of Commonwealth countries, but no Americans. There were many, many Americans that were part of the effort of the tunneling and all of uh, the other uh, factories, as they called them, that went into putting on the Great Escape, um, making documents, making uh, clothing, getting um, cameras, doing all sorts of getting maps. So. The Americans were very much involved, but before the Great Escape happened, they were removed to a different compound. And uh, it was, it was gut-wrenching to uh, all the men that had worked so hard, but um, that's, that's what had happened. Let me also speak to a couple things here. <coughs> this is the <coughs> museum, and it's a communist era building, but they've done uh, a lot of work on redoing many of the exhibits, and, and it's very interesting. Um, this is a small cemetery that is um, off of the grounds, but not too far away, 
and this is the <coughs> memorial to the 50. The RAF were allowed to design and build this uh, memorial. Um, as Ronald said, 50 of the men who escaped and were recaptured uh, were murdered by the Gestapo. And it's, um, it's, it's quite a horrible, horrible um, piece of history. But uh, the men were able to, again, during the war after this happened, to build this memorial. This is inside the museum and some of the flowers and memorials that the RAF uh, left on their, their last visit there. And this is also in the museum. This is a sculpture um, of a RAF uh, man carrying a, well, pulling a sled. And this is to commemorate uh, the long march, as they call it. And this was the evacuation <coughs> march. And um, Ronald gave you some good background on the march. Uh, the men knew something was up. They, they could hear the, alt the artillery. The Russians were getting very close, and it was only a matter of time. And Hitler decided, again, at the last minute, instead of allowing, um, perhaps, the Russians to come in and be able to free the, the prisoners, and then um, that they would proceed and also you know, make war on what was left of uh, the German army, that uh, he would move them in. And there were also ideas floated by the SS, um, by all sorts of factions um, in Hitler's uh, regime, to perhaps either hold the men as hostages. Some wanted to barter for better terms, perhaps. That was their thought, peace terms. Um, others thought uh, you know, they would uh, perhaps kill all of the men. Uh, there were all sorts of ideas floating around, but the, the main thing was the men were evacuated on, on short notice. And as you remember um, from your history, this winter in 1944-1945 uh, was the coldest and snowiest and most harsh in 50 years in Europe, so it, it was terrible. The men in South Camp were the ones that started out first of Stalaglub III. Uh, they were carrying everything uh, that they could, food-wise, clothing-wise, to, to keep warm. They didn't know where they were going. Their guards didn't know where they were going. Uh, they just flooded these little country lanes around the camp and were heading uh, generally towards Spremberg. There was a lot of confusion. There were no provisions um, for the men, no places uh, really to stay, no plan of, of what was going to happen. They were just marched out of the prison camp in the middle of the night into a blizzard. There were um, about six inches of snow, at least, uh, that they were marching through, and it was uh, sub-zero, so it was just horrible, horrible uh, conditions. Uh, this is another picture from the march, some of the men just uh, exhausted. And uh, I'll tell you a story, uh, my dad, when he was marched out of the camp, uh, when they got to rest the first night, he took his shoes off. And the next morning, he couldn't get his shoes back on, his feet had swelled so much. And so uh, he had to walk barefoot until his feet uh, went down. And this picture also reminds me of uh, Mr. Gore. Uh, his daughter and his son-in-law were on the trip with us. Uh, he's, he was a B-17 bombardier. But uh, he told me the story uh, at one of the reunions. He was so tired. And he was with South Compound. And they marched for 27 hours with only four hours rest in all of that 27 hours in this terrible condition. Um, and he told me one time he was just so tired, he sat down in the snow on the side of the road and he just, he felt like he couldn't go forward. And so his buddies, you know, were first kind of saying, come on, come on, let's go. And, and then they started, you know, cussing at him. They started being a little more direct and he just felt he couldn't go uh, another, another step. And so finally, he said, they started kicking me. And he said, finally, uh, something in me just uh, told me these guys really want me to get up. So he, he somehow mustered the strength and he went on. He survived the march. And um, again, 
but that's that's how the conditions were and no food no no water and the packs the sleds a lot of that a lot of what the men were carrying were dropped <coughs> along the way as as they uh, went further and, and got weaker okay switch to 2009 so we called ourselves the Kriegi kids uh, Kriegsgefangener is the German word for prisoner of war. Uh, the men themselves called themselves Kriegis, and the Germans called them uh, Kriegsgefangeners. And so we decided, we, since we were the children, that we'd be the Kriegi kids. So our group, we started out at the same place, the same time, the same date. Um, and the picture you see, there was snow, there was some ice, this was at the camp, um, this was leaving the camp. But we had headlamps, we had Gore-Tex, we had down coats. We knew where we were going, and, and food wasn't a, a concern. Um, so much, much different than, than how it was for our, for our fathers. Uh, these are just some of the small towns that, that we went through. And this uh, south compound didn't stop here, but some of the other men from the other compounds in Stalagluf III did. And we stopped at this church. The men afterwards, after the war, uh, gave money and dedicated a lovely stained glass window to this church and this plaque uh, thanking them because they crowded in the church. It was. Uh, it kept them out of the wind. I think with all the men, uh, there was body heat, so it was warm. Uh, there wasn't heat in the church, but they were so thankful that they had some shelter on part of that march. And this is uh, the barns of Grosselton, and this is where we stopped. This is where South Compound got four hours of sleep. Um, it's a large set of barns. They're, they're falling apart now. But uh, we put ourselves together for a picture with the American flag. Uh, we met the mayor there. Uh, had had a, a very interesting time. But uh, it was it was really something to be in that um, area where our fathers had been. And there's a lovely, I guess I would call it more like a, a manor house, a, a lovely house now, totally in disrepair. But a, a German count had lived there, and he and his wife brought out hot water. To, to the men, and it was uh, much appreciated. And a lot of things happened to us along the way. Um, we, we learned so much from one another and, and learned each other's stories. Sometimes we were just marching with our own thoughts, but certainly our dads were, uh, were right on our shoulders the whole way. But at the end of the march, when we did reach Spremberg, uh, we were then going, as we were leaving, we were getting on a bus, and then we were going to drive to the actual train station where our fathers, once they reached Spremberg, were put on the, the horrible 40 and 8 boxcars, 40 men or 8 horses, and my dad said there were 76 men in, in his boxcar, and they were jammed in, and uh, several... Um, many different um, situations and, and numbers of days that the men were on them, sometimes three days, uh, sometimes more. But the problem was they, were, they couldn't sit down even. They had to kind of go in shifts. People were getting sick. Um, they couldn't get out to go to the bathroom. Uh, it, was, it was horrible, and of course the boxcars that they were put in had had animals in them recently. So if you can imagine um, anything worse, and no ventilation. They only had two small uh, slits in both ends of the boxcar uh, for just slight ventilation. So it, it was a truly horrible um, experience, and that's what took them to their next camp, some of them all the way down to Moosburg, some to Nuremberg, some to other places. But as we got on the bus, we're waiting for other people to get on, and my husband just looked out and said, well, look at that fellow out there. He looks like he's got a jacket, and it looks like it's got some sort of Air Force um, emblem on it. Um, you know, as we're waiting for these other people, why don't we go ahead and go talk to him? Well, uh, of course, he didn't speak a, a word of English, 
but we were we had one woman with us who you know her German was from college a little rusty but you know it, it worked so we talked to this man and it turns out he and his wife were just shopping and it was one of those things just meant to be but he had actually seen the men he was a small boy had lived in Spremberg we're in Germany now and it was Germany then it's Germany now he was a small boy of 11 years old and he remembered seeing the men loaded onto the boxcars and marching and he said they looked so pitiful and they were so cold and some didn't have gloves and he remembered that and then he said well I'll show you where that train station is and then I've got to run home because I've got to I've got to get you something so we thought the train station was the normal train station in Spremberg but it was actually a different one where they loaded baggage and that's where our fathers were loaded onto the boxcars. But when Hans Burkhardt met us, he went home, got his car, came back, took us to the train station, and then he brought these two artifacts with him. Well, it just so happened that he had worked with a man who was much older than he, but had been a prisoner of war in the United States. He was a German that was captured, and he was held in Arkansas. And he bought this pocket watch while he was in America because he had some earnings from working on a farm while he was a POW, and he carved this eagle while he was there of eagles that he had seen flying. So he, before he died, he gave these two things to Hans. And Hans said, these really belong in a museum. Will you please take them? So we did, and, and we couldn't believe it, but uh, we did, and they're now in a POW museum in Aliceville, Alabama, with the story. And this is the train station uh, today that uh, our, our fathers were loaded on. And again, it made sense. They wouldn't load the prisoners from the regular train station where they would have had uh, passengers going to and fro. So this is where they, they handled the baggage and uh, our dads. And now we go on to Moosberg, and this um, is an article in German, and um, I'm sorry I can't uh, translate all of it, but uh, it's got a collage, a picture of our fathers uh, that we were honoring on the march. And uh, one of the women who is an author that was on the march with us uh, contacted the director of a museum in Moosberg and also the paper and got this put in uh, the paper. And so she emailed all of us and said, oh, you'll be so happy, uh, those pictures of, of your dads, our fathers have gone back to Moosburg. And so I go, oh, no, because Moosburg was horrible. It was much worse conditions than Stalagluf III. As, as the war was coming to an end, food was so hard to come by. The rail lines um, had suffered so much from the Allied bombing, and so the prisoners of war, of course, were, were last man on the totem pole. So if you're going to uh, get something through, um, you know, they'll think of the prisoners later. So um, my dad probably lost about 50 pounds um, in the prisoner of war camp, uh, and he didn't have that to lose. He was a thin, young, athletic man and uh, was uh, skin and bones when he came home, but, uh, but he came home. <coughs> And this is a picture um, at the time, again, of, of Moosburg. Um, if you can see the two steeples uh, in the very back, that church is still there, and we visited uh, that church. Um, the rest is, is changed. But this is uh, what Ronald spoke of, the camp that was built for 14,000 that held over 130. Uh, they don't even know how many, um, and at least 76 different nationalities. And this, uh, my father told me this story um, because, again, everyone was just poured into this camp. Um, sanitary conditions were, were terrible, food very scarce, uh, little water, uh, very difficult, very difficult living conditions. Um, and my father told me of, of seeing the first time he ever saw a Sikh from India because there were, of course, members of the Commonwealth and uh, there were prisoners that had been poured into this camp and undoing their turbans every day and combing their long hair and then wrapping uh, it back up in a turban. So um, 
he was getting quite a quite an education um, in in a very short time. And this is Moosburg today. What's left of it? Uh, there's some of the uh, the barracks of the staff are uh, still there, and it's used as uh, low income housing for uh, particularly some of the Turkish uh, workers in Germany. And the, in the museum there in Moosburg, um, there we are, the, the Kriegi kids, and they have a model of the camp um, in the foreground. They have all sorts of information there, and uh, we got a very wonderful reception from the director there at the museum, um, and he told us uh, a, a lot about it. <coughs> And this is Moosburg on the happiest day, on April 29th, when Patton came in and liberated the men. So the tanks came in through the gate. Uh, the men were cheering, mobbed the tanks. And uh, again, just a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, scene and a wonderful feeling for, for all of the men to, to be free. Um, one, one more thing I, I do want to, to tell you, um, of course this was a very sentimental uh, journey for, for all of us um, on the trip, and we, we understood a little bit, um, of course we, we were not recreating the trip, we were not reenactors, uh, we were doing a commemorative uh, march for our dads, but um, what I wore, and, and I can show it to you, later, but this is a Kriegi tag. So this is a German POW tag, dog tag, that the men were given, and uh, this was my father's, and I wore this on the march, again, made me feel a little closer, closer to him. Um, and the, uh, the other interesting thing about this, my father, who's, who uh, died in, in 2007, but he kept this every day of his life in his wallet. It wasn't on the, the little uh, leather uh, chain here, but he kept the tag in his wallet, and every day, and he was very positive, and he never got down too much, but um, he told me, you know, whenever he got a little bit down, he would take that out, and that would remind him that, you know, any day in freedom is a thousand times better in captivity and what he uh, what he endured during the war. So, anyway, um, with that, I'd, I'd like to take any any questions you might have. But uh, again, thank you very much for allowing me to uh, tell part of my dad's story. I really have two questions. One, uh, how long does it take you to physically? to the, the footmarks, and secondly, tell us a little about your dad after the war. Um, we, uh, let, let me, <coughs> um, we, we did, I think, uh, someone had a podometer, so we, we were 60.2 miles, but it was three and a half days, and, and the first night, we left at 11 at night, and uh, we walked till about 2.30 in the morning. And so we got about, you know, roughly nine and a half miles um, that, uh, that night. And then the next day we did um, 18 miles, but the curator at the Stalagluft III Museum had arranged, since we were the first Americans to do this, uh, he arranged for us to go to several, well, two schools and also to a factory where the men stayed. So we spent some time with the children, um, two different days at the schools, and just had a, a wonderful time. And then also at this factory. So and then we would start the march. So we would march uh, however long it, it took us. We would we had specified places we were going to stay in the in the evening. But um, that second day was one of the hardest because we had marched till in the morning. Then we got up early, went to the school, and then we did um, uh, over 18 miles. So that was that was a little uh, tough. And then um, the next day, about 14 miles, and then 17 and a half the last day, which was another long day. But um, again, our conditions—it it was in the 20s. 
uh, before we had gotten there, they had had a real cold snap, and, and it was zero, below zero. Um, the weather our fathers were in was just terrible. Uh, it didn't snow on us until Spremberg, and so we really had, again, much, uh, much better conditions. And another thing that I, that I should mention, um, that my father mentioned, and, and you'll read in many accounts, but um, the 11,000 men of, of Stolid Luft III weren't the only ones on those little roads, and, and some larger roads too, but, but um, as the Russians were coming in, again, this was still part of Germany, so civilians were streaming out because, again, of, of the horror stories and, and what um, they thought would happen and what did happen in many places when the Russians came in. So uh, you saw, but mainly, these civilians uh, were not the able-bodied, because all the able-bodied were fighting. Uh, so these were old women, old men, and children. And they may be pushing a baby buggy or, carry, or pulling a cart, you know, with everything that they, that they owned or could move. And so my dad said it was, it was just horrible, you know, to see that. And then a couple times they were moved, the men were moved off the road as German forces were um, on the road and moving up to go fight the, uh, fight the Russians. Um, and then my dad, after the war, uh, he came back, and um, I'll, I'll tell you another quick story maybe if, if you'll indulge me. Um, my father uh, got married to my mother right after he got his uh, wings, and then uh, when he went overseas, um, well, right before he went overseas, found out my mother was going to have um, uh, their first child. And he was in the prisoner of war camp, of course, when um, uh, my, what ended up to be my brother, my oldest brother was born. But my dad had no word because, again, letters came into the camps, but later in the war, no letters were getting through, and my father never received um, any letters. Um, he got a couple out, and uh, mother got, has a whole stack that came back to her, <laughs> um, unable to be delivered. But um, anyway, he was in a, a camp, and he knew my brother should be born the first part of January. A member of his squadron had been shot down, and so he came into the camp, and, and they had known, the wives had known each other because they had been in Dover when they were um, there in training before going overseas. And so he said, oh, do you have any word? Do you have any word on my wife? Did, did she have the baby? Is she okay? Uh, did I have a boy or a girl? Well, let me think now. You know, everybody's having babies. And um, yes, I know she's okay, because I remember I got a letter. Yes, um, you know, well, was it a boy or a girl? Well, I'm not really sure. I don't, you know, was it? I don't remember. My dad has this guy by the shirt collar and going, was it a boy or a girl? <laughs> so anyway, the guy, I don't remember. So anyway, it was until um, June 3rd when my father reached Boston that he found out for sure that mother was okay and he had a son. So um, when he came back, uh, he of course had to process out of, out of the military um, which he did, which took a number of months. But um, his father was, was ill at that time. He went into uh, his business, the Mid-Central Fish Company. And uh, so he got out of the military. They tried to call him back for Korea. But, and actually, all the men thought they were going back uh, to the um, uh, Pacific Theater. Because again, the, the war was not over yet. Um, there, so they thought they were uh, going to have a little time at home and, and then uh, go to the Pacific. But anyway, um, so he uh, was a later in life a manufacturer's rep for cutting tools, and um, we he, he really wasn't able to fly again. He flew a little uh, right after the war, but uh, just we always loved the planes and, and came out here and were spectators. When did he graduate from high school? Uh, I can look it up and give you the class. It was at Aloe Field in, in Texas in um, March, uh, well, March, probably about 12th of uh, 1944.
No. Beagle. They called themselves the Beagles. He was in Italy. Yeah, yeah. He went to Italy. Yes. How did he get out of Germany finally? Did they did it take him months and months and months or did they airlift those guys out or how'd that work? Uh, that's that's another um, interesting interesting story. But uh, it took them a while to get out, and, and if you read that, especially you know about Moosberg, um, de Gaulle was insistent that the French go first, and, and they kind of got out quickly, and then everyone else um, was waiting around. But uh, they took large transports, they took them into Reims, and then they went to La Havre, and they went by ship um, Southampton, and then back to the United States. Um, my dad did have a, a very interesting experience. Um, they took him to the um, airport where he was supposed to be picked up, and he and uh, about four other officers, they got there, they arrived uh, at the airstrip, and they were told, oh, sorry guys, last plane just left. And so they're going, well, you know, what do we do? And so they said, uh, well, don't know. Um, you know, you can sleep here on the tarmac. And so they're saying, you know, hey, we're, we're former prisoners of war, um, you know, not, not going to do that. So uh, as, as they were, they were always um, very ingenious and, and good at their own devices. But they ended up going into town there, the nearby town. They got a hold of uh, an American who was setting up the occupation office and explained their situation and said, we need somewhere to stay. So they ended up picking up um, the Burgermeister, who my dad says, you know, was at least 85 years old and scared to death, didn't know what they were going to do with him, but uh, the big American sergeant grabs this guy and says, these men need a place to stay tonight, you find them a place to stay. So they, they drove them up to this house, uh, they went up there, asked if they could stay, and uh, they did. And it ended up that this family, um, as we say, it was the nicest family in Germany. Uh, I think they were very uh, apprehensive about having these POWs uh, and enemies come stay in their house, and um, they sent their little boy to stay with uh, some friends, and the men, my father and the sergeant, went back to get some provisions, some food, since they were going to stay there for the night, and they brought it back, and right at the time when they came back to the house, some looters, allied Americans and others, were going house to house and, and looting. And um, again, a, a lot of things happened during the war. You don't you don't hear about that side of things. But they were going up to this house, and my dad and the other men said, "Stay away from this house. We're staying here. You know, leave these people alone." And so then uh, the Kraus family. Uh, realized or thought at least uh, perhaps these folks weren't going to destroy their house or maybe they were going to save everything for themselves and, and then take it when they left. But um, anyway, it ended up they brought the food to the Krauses and they had a dinner and this ended up being a VE night. So that was the night um, of the uh, end of the war officially. And so Mr. Krause went down, they, they all decided, you know, that they were, that they were friends. Mr. Krause went down and he had some German wine somehow that had survived the war and he brought that up and, and they had that and then, of course, my dad went down and made him bring up some more. But um, they, uh, they, they had a, a wonderful celebration and I, I'm sorry to make this, I'll try to shorten up the story a little bit, but uh, they gave him a postcard, they signed it, thank God, meaning the war's over, and uh, he always kept that postcard with him um, all of his life. I always saw it as, as a little girl. Well, my dad never was able to get back to Europe, but then on the 50th anniversary of VE Day, uh, we were finally in a, in a position that uh, we would be able to, to make that trip, and I asked him, I said, Dad, where do you want to be on VE night, you know, the, all the capitals of Europe are going to have big celebrations, you know, there will be big things in Paris and London, where, where do you want to be? And he just calmly looked at me and he said, well, I want to be the same place I was in 1945. And I go, oh, 
oh my, because I realized, you know, I, I knew that was a private home with a family. So, um, very long story, but I'll try to shorten it again. Uh, I made contact with the family, uh, the, the mother and father that were there um, had since died, but the family lived in the same house. The son uh, that they spirited away was uh, the man of the house now, and um, his wife and children, we have all become fast friends. We celebrated VE uh, night with them in 1995, and we have um, been close friends ever since, and their kids have come and visited us, and we correspond um, all the time. And in fact, when my husband and I go back for uh, the celebration of D-Day, we're going to go to Munich first and see the Krauss family. Was your father injured when his plane went down? Um, he he was, uh, but more like a more like a sprain. Um, his plane. He was strafing an aerodrome, and he was hit by ground fire, and his plane caught on fire. And so he gained altitude, and then he thought, well, he might be, he was losing glycol first, and then he thought he might be able to eke on, eke on home. And two of uh, his buddies came up on either side of him, but then the fire started, and so he thought, well, he can't, you know, he's got to get out of the plane. And so that's when he had trouble with that hatch. And my father was really, uh, according to Army regulations, um, too tall to be a fighter pilot. But his instructor knew how badly he wanted to be a fighter pilot and uh, had recommended him. And they kind of fudged some records and got him in. And so sitting on his May West and uh, with his height, he didn't have much uh, between his head and that canopy and those P-51s are, are pretty tight with all the gear in them. So he was trying to bang and get the hatch open. It wouldn't release, uh, so he thought he was going to have to ride the plane on in. Uh, but then finally, at the last moment, um, it opened. He, had a, he said he looked at the altimeter. Uh, it was 800 feet, and so he got out. His parachute opened. He took one swing. The next swing, he hit the ground. So he was very lucky uh, to uh, get out of that burning plane and, and survive. But um, I think he uh, he hurt his leg and his and his hip a little bit, but nothing nothing was broken. And uh, fortunately, so. Tell them what you have on the top of the plane. Oh yes, um, I've got some uh, some materials, kind of in poster fashion, from about the Great Escape, the tunnels. Uh, some, again, of the slides that you saw up there from the Stalag Glyph 3 Museum. Some books, <coughs> articles, and um, at the very end, there's a couple pages. I've got several copies, but uh, Stalag Glyph 3, there are books, movies, all sorts of things out there. Um, very good, all sorts of resources. So those are just a few of them. And some of the books that I've noted are people that were on our trip and their uh, father's books or their um, stories as told by their fathers. So um, again, lots of information, but please feel free to take one of those. And I also have the famous uh, Betty Poppies for any of you that would like to, to have one. Um, and again, in, in remembrance of all those that have served, and we thank uh, all of you, because I know a lot of you in the crowd um, are our great veterans. Well, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mary, if you'll just remain one moment. Uh, we've got a little something for you, but before I make that presentation, uh, I had just a couple of announcements I forgot. Uh, one, uh, please, uh, if you have any problems or troubles or do not have a door code or have any problems with it uh, or need one, please see Steve Zimmerman. Steve, if you stand up, let him see your smiling face. And it is standing. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you need to access, you'll need a door code.